Hey guys, it's Kimberly from Keep the Tail Wagging, and I am super excited to bring you Dr. Jean Dodds, and um, we are going to be talking about thyroid health and the canine blood bank and more. So Dr. Dodds, thank you so much for joining me today. You're welcome. So my first question is going to be about thyroid health, and I started having my dog's um, annual blood panels done probably a year ago, and after I did the first set, I learned that um, the blood panels aren't really a great way to test if a dog has a thyroid condition. So before I ask you about that, however, I wanted to ask you, how prevalent is um, thyroid conditions in our dogs? Well, thyroid conditions and other immunological dysfunctions are very, very prevalent in people and pets today. And in the industrial areas of New Jersey, for example, there's a tenfold increase in these diseases in people and the companion animals they share their homes with. Part of that is because of industrial pollution, reduction of the ozone layer, and then all the chemicals and pesticides and fertilizers and perhaps um, food imbalances that, that we and our pets eat. So thyroid disease is the most prevalent rising endocrine dysfunction, a durable disease like Cushing's disease being second to that in pets. It's very, very common today, and it's genetically predisposed. Oh, wow. So when you have inbred, linebred, purebred dogs, especially those that are popular with a founder sire effect, like a dog that wins a best of show or something and everybody wants to have its offspring, that influences the gene pool of dogs and cats very strongly. And so the animals descended from them are going to be more likely to be genetically predisposed to the environmental changes, especially over vaccination, for example. Oh, my gosh. I had no idea. So yeah, one, one thing, I was concerned that one of my dogs might have hypothyroidism. And so blood work was done and the veterinarian at the time said, oh no, she's fine. But I later learned that blood work isn't technically the best way or the blood panel that my vet was running wasn't the best one. There are special blood panels for hypothyroidism. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, that's actually quite correct. The larger veterinary reference labs have ways of promoting their routine wellness screening panels. And first of all, wellness screening is essential for pets and people. It doesn't have to be done every year in people because we age more slowly. But in pets, every year, an animal should go for a physical exam, a checkup, and blood work. Why? because 52% of dogs and 62% of cats have something that shows up in their blood before the clinical signs appear. In other words, you don't just wake up tomorrow and become hypothyroid, you have to progress to that point. Okay. So, back to your question. In order to make this attractive to the typical clinical veterinarian, they have these panels that have a blood counts and serum chemistries and a total T4. That can be so misleading because it can be normal and the veterinarians can dismiss the possibility of a thyroid function defect when you need a complete panel to show it up, especially in the early stages of the disease when it's inflammatory. So levels can look higher while the body is inflamed in response to the destructions it's going to go through. And it looks normal when in fact it's in these stages of destruction. Oh, wow. So you must have a complete thyroid antibody profile because most of thyroid disease in pets and often in people is caused by an autoimmune heritable problem called thyroiditis, inflammation of the thyroid gland. And it progresses over a year to a year and a half to two years in dogs and well, cats, yes, also cats are different, um, to hypothyroidism in the dog dog and hyperthyroidism, overactive thyroid in older cats. So if our pets are diagnosed with hypo or hyperthyroidism, that's not like, um, you know, like, oops, now we're going to lose our, what, like, do we have medications? What do we do then? Oh, absolutely, we have medication. It's very easy to treat the condition. It has to be diagnosed properly. And so pet owners are actually the major driver, along with my holistic veterinary colleagues, of pushing proper panels these days worldwide. We do this testing throughout the world, and samples come to us all the time because we're the only laboratory that does assays that are pat for thyroid function, that are patented, and do not use radioactive isotopes. So we're not going to contaminate the earth anymore. 
And we're the only laboratory that does age and breed specific interpretive comments. You don't pay extra for that. You get that automatically. And it's based on our 25 years of data base, looking at how a Chihuahua's thyroid is different from a Newfoundland or a Golden Retriever, whatever. Makes sense. The little guy's going to have a more active metabolism than the giant breed. So we do it based on age and breed specific norms and without isotopes. So back to the whole point. If it's abnormal, you treat it with thyroid therapy. You could do it synthetically, which is very safe, by the way, despite some people's natural bent against or <laughs> natural bent for against natural <laughs> therapies rather than synthetic. Um, but you must remember in the dog and the cat, the half-life of these hormones is much shorter than it is in people. 12 to 16 hours versus days in ourselves. So you have to give the medication for appropriate balance over 24 hours twice daily, even though this controversy has been going up and down and up and down in our profession for decades. Everybody seemed fine about twice a day until recently some, quote, veterinary expert said, oh, no, 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 you don't have to give it twice a day. Just give it once a day because the afternoon dose isn't even metabolized anyway. It's excreted. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Then they'd only be getting half the amount. Anyway, whatever. Twice a day always, and that's important. And, just before I forget, you must give it without foods that contain calcium or soy, or treats. Because calcium and soy bind to this drug and prevent it from being absorbed. Now, people that take thyroid hormone are usually told that by their physicians, but veterinarians were not taught that. Until recently, we're trying to emphasize how important it is not to give it with a piece of cheese, not to give it with um, a boat's, uh, uh, meat with any bones in it, because, or, or yogurt or whatever, because that will prevent the absorption of the drug. So you're not getting the full therapeutic effect. Now, People don't want to use synthetic hormone. They could use natural hormone products that we use in people, like Armour Thyroid or Rest Thyroid or Nature Thyroid. It's going to be two to four times more expensive. You cannot afford to give a Great Dane those products. Now, some people who are adamant give a little bit of that and then add the rest up with synthetic because of the cost. And then finally, there are people that believe that natural thyroid extracts uh, not the thyroid hormone, but extracts that stimulate the thyroid gland will work equally well. That's really not true. Uh, partially they can work because if the thyroid gland is being progressively destroyed, it doesn't have anything to stimulate. Mm -hmm. In other words, you can't make it work harder. There's only half left. So those can, can support and help the thyroid gland that's still there, left, but it can't replace what's missing. So about the, um, when we add the, the medication or the supplement, if I'm feeding raw and I have to do it twice a day, like how, many, how much time between when I feed my dog their regular meal and I give the medication do I have to have? Okay, it's more important that it be eight to 14 hours apart than exactly 12 hours to fit your normal feeding schedule. One hour before the raw diet or any diet or three hours after. So most, most people give it one hour before in the morning, in other words, they get up, instead of giving, they give the pill, and instead of feeding the animal, they run in the bathroom and get ready for the day. And I have a picture of a client with her three Cairn Terriers sitting outside the bathroom door, mom, mom, where's my food, where's my food? Because she had to hide for the hour before she could come <laughs> out and feed them. So she went in there and she did her normal toilet and she took in some magazines or whatever. And as soon as they, then once they got used to it, there was no problem. Yeah. <laughs> and then in the evening when you come home, the animals are the ones that greet you and love you. Why? Because they want their meal. Right? I mean, as well as loving you, of course. <laughs> so you feed them. And then you wait three hours when everybody's calm and you're watching TV or on the internet or whatever you do, listen to beautiful music. Then you give them the evening pill. Okay. That makes sense. It's easy. Yeah. yeah. And then finally, because I know that there's always that one person that hears this information and freaks out and decides, <laughs> well, I'm just going to go and buy a supplement right now. With, and what are the dangers of trying to supplement thyroid when you don't have hypothyroidism? Well, if you're giving the medication, it's dangerous. Absolutely. You, in, you reduce the lifespan, you increase aging because the metabolism is churned up, right? Working faster than it should. If you're giving a thyroid support natural supplement, it's probably not going to do anything. Okay. It's, it's not going to be harmful. 
unless you overdo anything, you know, more is not necessarily better. Um, and don't believe Dr. Google, remember, we have to look at everything we read today with the, what is the source, what is the reliability of the source, what is the experience of the source. And so to change topics, I definitely want to talk about blood banks. And this is so funny because, of course, it makes sense, but I had no idea until about a year or so ago that there was a blood bank for dogs. So how long has this been in existence? How did you come up with the idea to do this? And um, why is it that greyhounds are such a good match for our dogs? Okay, well, there's a lot of misunderstanding about that. When I was in New York State um, from 1965 until 1987, um, I was in charge of our own clinical research. We never did any invasive research. We only studied nature's accidents. In other words, animals born with blood diseases, bleeding diseases like hemophilia, mm -hmm. right? And we would, these animals were donated so we could care for them for the rest of their lives. In order to do that, we had to develop blood products like were given to human hemophiliacs, you know, as well as compatible blood and blood that didn't produce infectious disease. So we had the same screening issues. I was in charge then because there were no physician hematologists in the department at the time when AIDS and blood safety became the critical issue in the early 80s. I was in charge for humans, and when I developed the regulations along with experts in the state um, for the New York State Department of Health, I suddenly realized for the Red Cross, we need the same thing for animals. We need a Red Cross for animals. We'll call it Pet Lifeline. Hmm. But you know, for the name of the company, you need something a little bit more scientific. So I thought, Hemopet, nah. Hemopet, that's it. So Hemopet and Pet Lifeline started in 1990. Mm. I met my husband and moved to something, uh, uh, an independent woman moving away for a man. Can you believe that? <laughs> <laughs> and we've been married for 34 years and we're very happy, thank God. Anyway, when I got to California, I said to my husband, I'm not paying myself any money. I'm going to be a volunteer, and I still don't have any salary from what we do. Can I start a nonprofit animal blood bank like we have for people? He said, sure. Of course, in the stages of early love, why not, right? Well, he's stuck by it all this time, and he's now retired from his patent profession, patent attorney profession, and he helps us at he looked at. So we are the non-paid volunteers of, of the blood bank. So we started a blood bank. Why do we use greyhounds? First, we thought we'd get to the pounds and shelters in the greater LA area and adopt those large dogs that are not adopted because many people don't adopt the very large dogs. Mm -hmm. So as long as they were tractable, you know, friendly, and were large, we thought, well, maybe we could take a unit of blood, like uh, a regular human unit of blood, from these dogs, advertise them as having given their blood to save the lives of other dogs, and that would promote their adoption. Mm. Made sense, right? Yeah. It went all through the approvals until they decided that, quotes, this is terrible, little old ladies in tennis shoes are going to pick it and think it's inhumane. Never mind the bias there and the prejudicial comments that wouldn't be allowed today. So we didn't do that. So I thought, well, how am I going to get donors to do that? <gasps> Greyhounds. They're short-haired, they're docile. There's thousands of them that can be um, discarded by the racing industry. And what used to happen to them was just not mentionable. That, that's different today, by the way. They have better programs for adoption mandates after the animals are no longer racing. Mm -hmm. So we would get those animals and people say, well, you chose them because they all have the right blood type. That's not true. Oh. No, that's a total misnomer. First of all, there are 14 blood types in dogs of which three are critically important for transfusion reactions. Because the dog doesn't have pre-existing antibodies against the other blood types, you could usually safely transfuse a dog with any blood once. But if they got another blood exposure through contaminants in um, vaccines or anything else, with small blood cells in, in kidney disease uh, or whatever, they could have been sensitized, right? If they were um, a female that had had more than one litter by a, a mismatched sire, you could have like RH disease in newborn people, newborn babies, and you could get hemolytic disease in newborn. If you then transfuse that animal with the wrong type, they would die, or they could die, okay? So we have to type them, and you can't just give it. And about 
we end up by Christy screening for infectious diseases, and there's a huge increase in the number of infectious diseases uh, transmitted by blood into pets. Leishmaniasis, for one of them, being the prevalent in Europe, recently came over in fo fo hunting foxhounds into the Northeast, and it's now prevalent all along the southern seaboard and the eastern seaboard. So we have to test for all of these diseases. Now, if they're negative, then we do the blood screening, blood typing, and about we end up with about 10 to 15 percent of the total available greyhounds that pass the screening to be able to become donors at Hemopet. So what happens to the others? Well, because the smaller rescue groups don't have the scope and the requirement, regulatory requirement to do the testing, we've done most of that testing for them already. And the only thing they don't have is the right blood type for donation, but that's not what they're being used for. They're going to be homes, homed as pets. So we actually can help these other people by having to do the screening up front. Oh, nice. Yeah. So how many greyhounds do you think you've saved? Oh gosh, thousands, thousands, yeah. So uh, somewhere of the order of four or five thousand right now since wow. then, and we have between 175 and 210 greyhounds that live at Hemopet for the 10 months to a year until they're adopted out as pets. And during that 10 months to a year, they donate a half-sized unit of blood, pediatric unit, 250 mil, mm -hmm. twice a month if they weigh 55 to 80 pounds three times a month if they weigh over 80 pounds. And that's nowhere near the maximum volume they could donate. So we don't do anything. We just take a unit, they sit there quietly, it takes four minutes by gravity flow to collect the blood. They get a cookie, they get a special hug, and then this blood is sent all, out, all throughout the United States and in Hong Kong, by the way. It saves 40% of the blood supply in the United States comes from Hemopet, and we're a nonprofit charity. And that saves countless, it's just a service now, the blood goes to veterinary clinics to save the lives of pets in need. So if this blood bank didn't exist and we were being challenged all the time by some very nasty media stuff, which is not true by the way, absolutely not true, then those animals could die. Yeah. And it's very fine for someone to say, I'm challenging the ethics of what they're doing because, quotes, the animals are captives. The law in the state of California says commercial mud banks, have, mud banks have to be in a closed facility to make sure they don't pick up infectious diseases. Remember, you and I could carry a virus. We could be healthy. But if we give our blood to a sick person, it could make them sick. Yeah. So they're, they're not captive at all. I mean, all animals that we have stewardship over are captive when we're in our homes. Birds are in cages. Sentry dogs are blood police, you know, fire dogs, birding and grooming kennels. We have to keep the animals confined for their own safety. That, that, that's not bad. Yeah. That's what society has to do. To be, if we let them all run free, they'd be killed, some of them, most of them probably, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So that's how it works. Oh, that's so, I love, I just love what you're doing. It's just so exciting to me. And finally, what's one thing that you believed wholeheartedly, but you've now since changed your mind about? That I have and have not. That you have changed your mind about. Hmm. When I was a clinical scientist researcher, non-invasive stuff in like the 60s and early 70s, I thought vaccines were what every animal had to have. As often as possible to keep them immune. Was I dumb? Was I uninformed? Did I not understand that immunity was lifelong? I mean, memory cells, think of it. The child that has a peanut allergy, that child is sensitized against peanuts for life. That's why they announce on the airlines when you're traveling, there's somebody on the plane with a peanut allergy, please, we are not serving any peanuts or related nuts. Please don't eat any, you know, because even the smell of it in the air can cause a reaction. Now I know that that's not true. Vaccines done appropriately to puppies or kittens or infants protect them with immune memory cells for life. And you can tell that by periodically doing a blood test to make sure the antibody level is good. You know, recently, they have a huge furor about the amount of aluminum in vaccines for people. Mm -hmm. They've reason we've known that for a long time, but the recent paper showed that infants are given 17 times more than the safe EPA level of aluminum in the vaccines they get when they're born. 17 times more aluminum. And what does aluminum do? It produces effects in the brain, even autism. It affects the brain, memory, and cognition. What are we doing here? 
right? Right, right. Yeah, I stopped vaccinating my dogs. Well, I have four dogs. The puppies went through their puppy vaccinations and their annual booster, and I stopped. And Rodrigo and Sydney, sadly, they're not, almost nine years old. I did the annual vaccinations until someone um, shared an article with me that made sense. And so I stopped. And <laughs> I'm thankful because I, I live in the Pacific Northwest um, and I have access to a lot of holistic veterinarians. And our veterinarian, when we first met and they saw our dogs, I said, no vaccinations. And they said, okay. And we just went about our our visits, and I I love that they support that. But I just I feel like my dogs are fine. Yes, you know I've been teaching this subject all over the world, and last year I was teaching in Serbia, in Yorkshire, in Northern England, um, in uh, Denmark. And I was a major speaker, six topics in Brisbane, Australia, at their national meeting. And they said they would invite me because they don't like quotes, holistic veterinarians, as long as I told them how to set up a blood bank like we did with Hemopet. <laughs> so anyway, I teach vaccine issues all around the world. And the biggest concern these people have, even in Serbia, of all things, oh, in Israel, I did two topics in Israel, two, two talks in Israel in February last year. They're not going to make any money if they don't send the client a reminder to come in to get a vaccine because they won't come in for a checkup. I said, wait a minute. First of all, you make more money doing a vaccine antibody tire level than you do giving the vaccine, number one. Number two, you call it a, an annual checkup and vaccine update. And when they come for the update, you explain, we're not going to vaccinate, Mrs. Jones. We're going to do a blood test and explain why. It actually costs a little bit more, but it's much safer for your pet. It's no problem. And they said, oh, I get it, I get it. Yeah, I mean, that's what my, my reminders say. My, my reminders are the an annual wellness check. Yeah. They don't even mention vaccinations. Right. And, and I'm trying to transition these people into thinking outside the box. So come on, you guys, think outside the box. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for doing that. I, I need it. It's because it's hard. It's hard as a pet parent to walk into a veterinarian's office. And even though we know we need to advocate for our pets, it's hard. To, yes, of course. To protect them from that vaccinations, and I've even been in a vet's office where they were going to do it anyway, where no. I had to like, like literally pull my dog aside and go, no, no vaccinations. And well, you know, they suppose there. Kimberly, okay, well, they're supposed to get informed consent, even if it's it doesn't have to be written, but there has to be a note in the chart, discuss vaccinations, client. Uh, de declines, whatever. It has to be noted, okay? And whatever we do as advocates for change, we have to do it nicely with professional respect. And if they keep pushing, you say, thank you very much. Let me think about it and get the hell out. Sorry, but, <laughs> you know, we I mean, don't say no, 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 and be rude. Just say, I'll think about it. And <laughs> Dr. Dawes, thank you so much for talking with me today. You're welcome. <laughs>